of the United States. Sit down. I, good evening. I have a, a statement. This week, we marked an anniversary here in Washington, at least some of us did, the 1,000th day since we charted a new course for America. From the outset, we knew that a breaking with the past and beginning on the new road would be long and hard, and it has been. Coming to grips with the most serious economic crisis in post-war history has tested our mettle, our patience, and our unity. And believe me, I understand how difficult it's been to hear that America is making sure and steady progress when it's our family and friends who are suffering the ache and disappointment of hard times. But we Americans are a people of deep faith, hard work, and common sense, and we never stop believing in ourselves. So we're emerging with renewed confidence. We've made great strides in these first thousand days. Inflation and interest rates are down dramatically. We've passed the first real tax cut for everyone in nearly 20 years, and now a strong recovery is sending Americans back to work. Almost 400,000 found jobs last month. We have the highest number of people working in our history, almost 102 million. Virtually every sector of the economy, from construction to the auto industry to high technology, is expanding, creating new hope and a more secure future. We have the chance to build the kind of lasting economic expansion that this nation has not enjoyed since the 1960s. And I ask the Congress for cooperation in these last four weeks before it leaves for the year. Many key budget decisions remain, and we have a real opportunity to hold down spending and reduce deficits. And I think we should remember these deficits didn't just spring up in a thousand days. They're the product of too many years of tax and tax and spend and spend. In these closing days of Congress, let us rededicate ourselves not to taxing people more, but to making government spend less. This is the way to keep the United States on a steady path of economic growth and opportunity for all our people. And now, your questions. Ken? Mr. President, regarding the recent rebel attacks on a Nicaraguan oil depot, is it proper for the CIA to be involved in planning such attacks and in supplying equipment for air raids? And do the American people have a right to be informed about any CIA role? I think covert actions have been uh, a part of government and a part of government's uh, responsibilities for as long as there's been a, a government. Uh, I'm not going to comment on what, if any, connection uh, such activities might have had with what has been going on or with some of the specific operations down there, but uh, I do believe in the right of a country when it believes that its interests are best served to practice covert activity and then, well, your people may have a right to know, you can't let your people know without letting the wrong people know, uh, those that uh, are in opposition to what you're doing. Mr. President, there's growing concern about the Marines in Lebanon, and your National Security Affairs Advisor has said that the, the loss of life is unacceptable and that the partition of Lebanon is unacceptable. What are you going to do about it? And I'd like to follow up. Helen, we're going to keep on doing what we have been doing, trying to complete the plan that we launched a little more than a year ago. Uh, we know there are hazards there, and no one can feel more deeply about the loss of life the wounding of some of our men there. We knew it was a hazardous undertaking when we uh, joined in the multinational force. But our objective remains the same. Uh, we have made great progress there. If you remember back, uh, Beirut itself was being shelled daily in an exchange of fire that was killing literally hundreds of civilians on a daily basis, wounding others grievously. Uh, that, uh, a ceasefire followed there. 
A government was created, representatives to a parliament were elected, the Israelis have withdrawn to the Awali River and have announced their intention of permanently withdrawing. Uh, the disorders that have plagued Lebanon for some eight years have, uh, have of course, taken over. This was one of the reasons for a multinational force to try and uh, have some stability while the government, and incidentally, uh, I left out the fact that the Lebanese army, which has been created by this new government and in which we've helped with training and supplies, is uh, a fine army, not as big as it should be for the problems it's confronted with. But the mission is to enable the Lebanese government and its military to take over its own country with the withdrawal of all forces. Uh, earlier in that first ceasefire, uh, there was a successful ousting of some 10,000 of the PLO militia uh, from the country. Uh, as long as there's a possibility of making the overall peace plan work, uh, uh, we're going to stay there. Well, may I ask, what plans do you contemplate? How will you broaden the peace in the Middle East and bring about a reconciliation of all the parties and the restoration of the legitimate rights of the Palestinians? Well, this, you've named exactly the goals of the plan that I proposed a year ago last September. And it began with trying to straighten up the Lebanese situation with the border of Israel, the northern border, being violated as it was by terrorist groups, innocent people there being killed. Uh, they had a responsibility to try and defend that border. Now an agreement has been reached between the Lebanese government and is Israel. Uh, we are doing everything we can to persuade Syria to uh, quit being a roadblock uh, in this process. But that was the first phase, Lebanon. Then, and our intention remains the same, working with the more moderate Arab states to bring about the kind of peace with Israel that Anwar Sadat helped bring about. Our process is following the lead that was established in the Camp David uh, talks and the two United Nations resolutions, 242 and 338. And this is what we want to do. But, as I say, it all is kind of hinging on the resolution of, of Lebanon. Yes, Sam? Mr. President, Senator Helms has been saying on the Senate floor that Martin Luther King Jr. had communist associations, was a communist sympathizer. Do you agree? We'll know in about 35 years, won't we? Uh, no, I don't fault Senator Helms' uh, sincerity with regard to wanting uh, the, uh, the records uh, opened up. I think that uh, he's motivated by a feeling that if we're going to have uh, a national holiday named for any American, when it's only been named for one American in all our history, uh, to this time that uh, he feels we should know everything there is to know about an individual. Uh, I say I don't uh, fault his sincerity in that, but I also recognize there is no way that these records can be opened because an agreement was reached between the family uh, and the government uh, with regard to those records, and uh, we're not going to uh, we're not going to turn away from that or set a precedent of breaking agreements of that kind. Well, so, sir, what do we do then in 35 years if the uh, records are opened and uh, we find that Dr. King was a communist sympathizer? Do we then try to undo the law? I mean, I do, I'm not quite certain where the logic is here. The, the logic is there in that there is no way uh, that this government should violate its word and open those records now. Uh, I happen to... Uh, while I would have preferred a day of recognition uh, uh, for his accomplishments and what he meant in a uh, stormy period in our history here, I would have preferred a day similar to, say, Lincoln's uh, birthday, which is not technically a national holiday, but is certainly a day uh, reverenced by a great many people in our country and has been. I would have preferred that, but since they seem bent on uh, making it a national holiday, I believe the symbolism of that day is important enough that I would, I'll sign that legislation when it reaches my desk. Uh, Mr. President, when I was in the Marines, the 
doctrine was to take the high ground and hold it and not to deploy on a flat open field like the Beirut airport. Uh, what reason is there to prevent the Marines from uh, taking some more defensible positions in pursuit of the policy for which you've sent them there? Well, Jerry, all of those things we're asking ourselves and we're looking at everything that can be done to try and make their position safer, but you must remember, you were talking about and you were being trained as Marines for combat. Uh, and if these Marines had gone there to join in the combat uh, on the side of whatever force uh, we might have picked, then all of those rules would apply. But they're there as part of a multinational force to try and maintain a stability and uh, their sector happens to be trying to maintain that airport and open it up uh, for traffic. So uh, air airports just happen to be flat. And we're, we're doing everything we can and making everything possible for them to defend themselves. Uh, sir, does that mean that they cannot sally forth from the <coughs> borders of the area to which they're assigned if they are attacked from a nearby position, whether it's high ground or not? All I can tell you is that uh, I can't answer that question right now, but I virtually daily um, tell our people that, and to be in consultation with the uh, men on the ground, the commanders there of those units, or anything that in keeping with our mission uh, that we can do to uh, help ensure their safety. Now let me turn over another direction. Andrea. Mr. President, you had said in the past, a year and a half ago, following up on Sam, that you had real reservations about the expense of another national holiday. In fact, to quote you, you said, it might be that there is no way we could afford all of those holidays that we would have with people who are also revered figures in history of many of the groups that make up our population. So I'm wondering, what, why have you changed your mind now about the holiday for Dr. King, and why are you willing to sign that legislation? Because I think, I think this has become so symbolic of what was a very real crisis uh, in our history, and uh, a discrimination that was pretty foreign to what is normal with us, and the part that he played in that, I think that the symbolism of it uh, is worthy of this. Can you explain to us why you've decided to spend the coming weekend in Augusta at a golf club that is very exclusive and that we understand has no black members? I don't know anything about the membership, but I know that there are nothing in the bylaws of that club uh, that advocates any discrimination of any kind. Uh, I saw uh, in a recent tournament down there, national tournament, I saw blacks playing in that tournament on that course. I've been invited as a guest to go down and play a round of golf on the Augusta Golf Course. And uh, as I say, I think I've covered uh, all that I know about it. Uh, Dean? Mr. President, uh, your uh, recent uh, nomination of uh, Judge Clark as Interior Secretary uh, shocked just about everybody but yourself and Judge Clark, I think. Um, I wonder, sir, if you could tell us uh, what qualifications he has for that uh, Interior Department post. Well, I think the qualifications of being a very able and fine administrator and manager, I have known him from the time when he was uh, my chief of staff when I was governor in California. I know that on the bench of, uh, as a Supreme Court Justice of California, uh, he dealt with many problems of this kind. I know of his own personal interest and knowledge in this field. He's a fourth generation rancher, as he himself has stated. Uh, he's greatly interested in this entire subject, and uh, I believe that he will do a fine job in carrying out the policies which I've advocated there. Did he want to leave the National Security Post? He expressed a very definite interest in uh, uh, that position. And as I say, it did not surprise me knowing of his great interest uh, in that. And uh, I appointed him. Kathy? President, after years of bipartisan work on a comprehensive immigration reform bill, it appears uh, House Speaker O'Neill has successfully blocked action on it in the House. And he even suggested that you might veto it for political purposes. What, if anything, are you going to do to help House Republicans who are trying to free up that bill? I am going to try and get and have been supportive of um, 
an immigration, some immigration legislation for a long time. This country has lost control of its own borders, and no country can sustain that kind of position. I supported actively and worked hard for the passage twice of uh, the Senate bill on immigration. I will admit that the House bill, uh, I had some disagreements with uh, some of the structure in the, form, in the form of that bill, but recognized that there was a process called conference uh, when there were differences between the two bills. I want to sign as quickly as possible immigration legislation. Now I'm going to have to shift again here. Steve? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, let's speak about re-election, if you might, for a moment. You have said that you wanted to delay the decision as long as possible to maintain your credibility with Congress, for instance. This is understandable, as I see it, as long as you run, but it's getting late. And if you don't run at this point, other Republicans who would then have an interest in it would be way behind their Democratic opponents. Uh, it would seem to hurt the party. Therefore, practically speaking now, don't you have to run? <laughs> I have to commend all of you people. You can find more different ways of asking that question. Uh, <laughs> yes, and down the road, uh, one day, probably in the not too distant future, uh, probably before my birthday, uh, I will, uh, I will uh, put your minds all at rest, one way or the other. And uh, I don't think, in the first place, I think that campaigns are too long. And uh, I think one of the reasons we don't have as many people voting as we should in this country is not because they haven't got an interest, but because we satiate them and we wear them out until they seem to be campaigning year in and year out and uh, uh, day in and day out. And uh, if the, any of the Democratic candidates are listening, yes, I mean them. Uh, do with this. So uh, I don't think there would be any harm done by, uh, I know that um, uh, some in a, uh, who've preceded me in this office uh, have waited much longer than I'll probably wait uh, before they've said anything about it. Just to make sure, every time we've heard it, it's been a little later. Your birthday, I think, is in February. Is that now the schedule? Uh, no, I just happened to mention that. Uh, <laughs> We'll be here by Christmas. What? By Christmas, perhaps. Uh, it's it's possible. I, you know, I'm unpredictable in many ways. Uh, Leslie. Mr. President, back to the Middle East. Uh, you said that the Syrians are uh, being a roadblock to uh, the situation in Lebanon, but there are analysts who say that they are deliberately foot dragging and, in fact, harassing us and the Marines over there in order to wear you down so that you will pull the Marines out. Number one, do you agree with that assessment? Is that what the Syrians are doing? And secondly, uh, can you be worn down? Well, the answer to the first part of the question is that uh, I know the Syrians are dragging the feet, but they have, there have been other indications as to the reason for that. Uh, Syria, for many years, has talked about a thing called Greater Syria, in which they've believed that much of Jordan and much of Lebanon truly uh, should belong to them. And I think that they have that kind of an interest in this and aided and abetted by about 7,000 Soviet advisors and technicians and uh, uh, some pretty sophisticated Soviet weaponry. I think that they are contributing to the disorder and the trouble. Now, if they're doing it with the idea of wearing me down, they're going to be disappointed. Could you uh, clarify that? What do you mean? Disappointed. What, are, what are you going to have the Marines doing if they escalate, for instance? Uh, well, the Marines will always defend themselves, and uh, we will provide that defense. But we're going to, we, I know that many of the Arab nations uh, have been joining us. We're going to continue the diplomatic process that was advanced so brilliantly by Phil Habib and by uh, Ambassador McFarlane. Uh, which brought about the present situation and the, the uh, desire of the government there to now broaden its base and bring in some of the dissident groups and all, we're going to continue with that process. But I don't think there's any way that we should stand by and, uh, and just let uh, Syria destroy what so many people uh, want, which is peace and order there in that troubled country. 
Mr. President, uh, do you feel the Soviets will negotiate seriously on arms control once the presidential election heats up, or is it a matter of achieving an agreement in the next several months or waiting till 1985? Now, wait a minute. Try that again. I think I was still thinking about some things that I would have said in addition to my other answer. Given the, <laughs> given the uncertainty that a presidential election would create, would you feel the Soviets would still negotiate seriously on arms control once the presidential election heats up, or is it a matter of achieving something between now and the time you announce, or waiting till 85? I think the Soviets are going to negotiate seriously. Uh, there is a great propaganda effort going on on their part now because their target is, they've been encouraged by some of the uh, demonstrations that they've helped organize throughout the world. They think maybe they could persuade our allies to uh, turn back and not ask us for the deployment of the intermediate range weapons. Well, we're going to deploy and deploy on schedule. And once they see we're going to do that, and now that they know that we're determined to build our strength and not unilaterally disarm as we so foolishly have done over recent years, I think they're going to see that the best thing for them is to negotiate with us and in good faith. And uh, they may do some things, uh, they may try, as has been rumored, walk out and things of that kind. But um, we'll just wait at the table and I think they'll come back. Mr. Trump, I can follow up. Do you feel confident that you will get an agreement by the end of your first term? By the end, end of this term? This term, yes. Well, I, I hope very much that we will. We've been at this. I realize the history of negotiations in the past has been long drawn out. But if you will look at some of the negotiations in the past, maybe it was long drawn out because the longer the Soviets sat there, the more we unilaterally disarmed. And they found that just by waiting, uh, they could get things that they wanted. Well, we're not doing that. We're, we're arming. Yes? Mr. President, before the United States went into Vietnam, the French suffered a devastating defeat there by putting their troops in a saucer-shaped depression with the enemy up around the sides shooting down on them. Doesn't this uh, appear uncomfortably similar to uh, you, to the way we are deploying our troops in Lebanon on the low ground? And uh, how soon can we expect that we're going to redeploy them to a spot that makes more sense? Well, right now with the ceasefire, it isn't from high ground that they're being fired upon. Uh, actually, much of this that has tragically taken lives there is literally coming from civilians, from radicals in residential neighborhoods where we have always refrained from using artillery cover or anything of that kind. And uh, when they were fired upon from the hills, that's when naval gunfire responded. And maybe the French at Dien Bien Phu uh, in that terrible defeat uh, didn't have a New Jersey sitting offshore, as we do. You're still being killed, sir. I, I know, and as I say, most of this from the sniper-type fire. As a matter of fact, uh, some of the TV news accounts have carried actual interviews uh, with the very young men who are doing this and who are claiming their right, and yet they are not even members of some of the uh, unofficial militia. They are just individuals that are out murdering. And uh, we're, we're not sitting idly by. We're looking at every option and everything that we can do that can leave us in the position to carry out the mission for which they were sent and at the same time make their lives safer. Mr. President, Iran has threatened to close the Strait of Hormuz if Iraq uses its French fighters against Iranian interests. Is the U.S. prepared to use military force to stop Iran from cutting off our oil? And do you believe we would be successful? Let me just say that I don't think it would be proper for me to talk about tactics or what might be done, but I will say this. I do not believe the free world could stand by and allow anyone to close the Straits of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf. Uh, to the oil traffic uh, through those waterways. Can you say how far we'd be willing to go? You know, as I say, that's for them to wonder about. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, I have to call on you. I talked to your boss the other day. Thank you. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, sir, I want to ask you about a proposal that you are backing this before the Senate now. I don't think they've passed it quite yet, but they're about to. It's that project for democracy. And we, it would mean, I believe, that we would provide taxpayers' money and, and uh, quiet private sector leaders to go into other countries and decide if they have a democratic government or not. <coughs> if we think they don't, then we would turn over that government and set up a government that we like. Don't you think that would get us into a lot of wars? Sarah, that's not the aim of this program. This is what you're talking about is the thing that I spoke to the British Parliament about when I was there at the, at the European summit. No, what we have in mind is that the Marxist-Leninists uh, and the World Socialist Movement, for that matter, have, they've been ardent missionaries for their beliefs all over the world. And we in the democracies, and where free enterprise is practiced, have just sort of thought that uh, maybe everyone could see how well we're doing and uh, follow our lead. No, the proposal is for people to go and be the same kind of missionaries and see if they cannot explain democracy. One of the first meetings we had in connection with that was here in this room, in which uh, people from all over the world came, and the, it was a session during our election year to tell them about elections and how legitimate elections could be won, not those kind where you've only got one person to vote for and you'd better vote for him or somebody will come and get you. And uh, it's going to be, it's an education program. The idea of worldwide and pointing out the differences that those countries that have chosen new countries, whether it's Taiwan, Singapore, uh, South Korea, uh, those, those countries that have chosen our idea, our way, instead of uh, statism, authoritarianism or totalitarianism, their living standard, their prosperity, their freedom for their people is so much greater than anything the other countries have. We just want to explain to people how it works. Gary? Mr. President, uh, thank you. Do you favor the uh, five-year program that Cap Weinberger has recommended to you for the outer space defense uh, of, of this country? Gary, nothing has actually been presented to me as yet. I'm fascinated with reading all about it, but I haven't seen it, and I can tell you that no one has suggested any such figure uh, in the billions of dollars that have been proposed. All of this is simply the carrying out of what I asked for uh, quite some time ago, and that was for us to see if there is not a defensive weapon that can stop this race in offensive weapons throughout the world that can render maybe a system of horrifying weapons uh, obsolete. And so they're proceeding with the research on that. But uh, I think there's a great exaggeration of the kind of money that's being talked. Well, can I follow up? Would this not create, instead of an offensive arms race, a defensive arms race uh, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union? Well, would that be all bad? Uh, if you've got everybody building defense, uh, then nobody's going to start a war. Uh, and uh, that's maybe part of the idea. The, the danger that we're in today was voiced by Dwight Eisenhower in a letter uh, to a publisher back in 1956, in which he, a man of war, said that couldn't we see that the weapons that we're building today are making victory or defeat obsolete? That we are coming to a stage in weaponry in which there can be no victory as we've always thought of it, no winner or loser in war. There can just be the destruction of the people. And he said, when that moment arrives, and I think it has arrived, he said, then won't we have the common sense to sit down at a negotiating table and do away with war as a means of settling our disputes. Mr. President, new figures out today show that housing starts were down pretty sharply last month, and the figure the number of building permits went down for the second month in a row. Um, analysts are saying this could mean the economic recovery is going to level off, maybe uh, kind of peter out next year, and uh, more people are becoming concerned about high interest rates. Given the big deficits being projected by your own administration, isn't it time for some strong action by you to, to get interest rates down? Well, I think what we're doing is aimed at getting interest rates down. Now, I'm not sure that interest rates 
entirely are to blame uh, for this. And I don't know whether the recent figures, uh, in the first place, they're still way above what they were uh, not too long ago before this recovery started, uh, running around a million seven or something. But uh, what I want to know is, are they seasonally adjusted or not? And I have to tell you, I have not seen any evidence as to whether they are, and I'm going to make an inquiry. Because uh, if they're not, then you have to say, well, is interest rate, uh, is that the principal cause or only cause? Or is it possible because people don't start building houses back in the East and the Middle West and in the snow country uh, when autumn comes? Now, there is a, a great drop off in building. Now, if it is seasonally adjusted, then we have to look at things like the interest rates. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if people are waiting. So economic recovery can have your, uh, your estimate. Our previous estimates of the uh, horrendous deficits have already been trimmed back by the amount of recovery that we've had so far. The other part of that is structural. It is built in because of government spending. And I'm going to continue, as hard as I can, trying to get further reductions in government spending as a means of bringing down the deficits and getting us to the point of balanced budget, which we must reach. I have grown up listening to the other party year after year in the 40-odd years in which they have controlled both houses of the Congress tell us that deficit spending was necessary and a little inflation also to maintain prosperity. Well, I used to predict out in the mashed potato circuit that what is happening would happen. Uh, we, the bottom would fall out, and it did. But now that recovery, and if we can continue more spending cuts, if we had obtained the cuts we asked for, uh, in the beginning of our economic recovery program, the deficit would be $40 billion smaller than it is right now. Thank you, Mr. President. Helen.